do 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 Hey Bill, how do you pronounce your last name? Um, you're not gonna be able to say it, but uh, it's yes. <laughs> um, Demir Kapo. Do you want me to try it? I mean, I I, I don't care. I I won't get offended if you don't say it. <laughs> okay, looks like we are live. Yep, we seem to be live. All right, welcome everyone. I want to uh, introduce Bill. Bill, I uh, just tried to do your last name in my head and I was not successful at it. So I'd like you to say it for everybody if you uh, care to. Uh, sure, it's Demir Kappa. All right, thank you for that. That was uh, instead of me murdering that, I wanted you to try it. So. Um, he, Bill did a talk on demystifying modern Windows rootkits. This is your opportunity to ask questions of Bill. So there are a few questions already coming in through the uh, Track 1 Live QA channel. Let's just go ahead and get started. So Aragon asks, what, is the e what are the easiest features to find that might reveal a modern rootkit via static analysis? Um, I think a good place to start for a static analysis is going to be the um, um, obviously the strings, uh, because if they leave any debug strings behind or any unique strings for that specific binary, uh, that's a good thing to maybe you know add to your signatures. Uh, but another opportunity is going to be um, the imports of the driver. Uh, for example, if a driver imports a bunch of undocumented functions, uh, that's obviously going to be a little bit more suspicious, given that. Uh, legitimate drivers tend to try to stick, you know, with what's documented and when, with what's stable. So if there's any functions that it imports that is not stable uh, or is it's very, you know, it's just not really known about, uh, it's something to look at. Oh, so anything undocumented that's getting pulled in, you're thinking that's going to be your, your opportunity for, for shenanigans on that side. All right. Uh, did you... <laughs> what was that, pasties? Oh, I was, I was just going to say that the potential shenanigans potential could, could shenanigans. still be legitimate. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so next question uh, from RPTK2015. Did you actually find any P key when searching in Gray Hat? Uh, mentioned in the context of using a legitimate key to sign your driver. Yes. Uh, so um, I didn't, of course, crack any of them. Uh, but, I mean, some of them were pretty obviously related to code signing. For example, I remember one that had, like, code signing in its name. Um, so it was it was pretty clear that these were probably associated with uh, code signing and that um, there was it's, it's potentially, if you crack it, you could use it for kernel, kernel mode code signing. It all depends on the um, type of certificate it is and, you know, what type, what vendor it came from and stuff like that. Uh, but I have definitely, I can confirm that I've seen um, potentially viable uh is uh, private keys uh, on Gray Hat. Do you, do you know if there are some uh, keys that are like more trusted than others, like some that you can use to sign code, but there aren't trusted for like kernel level drivers or something like that? I assume a, a, a like a Microsoft signing key is like gold, but uh... yeah, yeah. So usually, what how it worked is that you have um, like these uh, certificate companies that issue these code signing certificates, and they work with Microsoft to get what's called a cross-signing certificate. So this means that Microsoft says, yes, you can use this um, this vendor or this root, this root authority can issue certificates for kernel mode code signing, just to give you an example there. And um, and so what you can do there is um, you can, so uh, some vendors will, don't have a cross-signing cert and they probably will not work for kernel mode code signing while others do. Um, and so there's that's usually the uh, different levels is whether or not the vendor has uh, you know, deals with Microsoft or has a cross-signing certificate from Microsoft. Uh, where would cool. I look up that information if I wanted to find out more of a specific cert? Or... Yeah, so I think uh, Microsoft has like a list of cross-signing certificates on on just their um, uh, on on MSDN uh, Microsoft documentation. Uh, it's yeah, I, I found a page here. It's like um, cross certificates for kernel mode code signing. Gotcha. Okay, so. A follow-up question on that one would be, what's a good place to find leak certificates were I to decide I needed one? Yeah, so um, one of the places I mentioned that uh, it's a good place to start for looking for leak certificates is going to be um, 
on the uh, so cheating related forums. There's quite a few available there that some of them have been out for years. Uh, and I still think that so you can use them uh, because a lot of the a lot of antivirus simply don't have detections in place uh, for these leak certificates, even ones that again have been out for years. Uh, so if you're out looking for a leak certificate, um, look at game hacking forums. Look at, like search for leak certificates, and then the game hacking forums names, and I'm I can guarantee you that you'll find some. That's an interesting crossover that totally makes. A, a ton of sense, but I was, uh, it's, it's not something that would have come to mind if I was ever going to go looking for that. Um, yeah, especially considering who's making these things and, you know, who, who builds a lot of the games out there. Um, RPTK has another question there. Can you explain a little more about why would the kernel accept a driver signed by an expired certificate? Yes. Uh, so when you see, um, a, a let's say you go into the digital signature section of a driver and you see a certificate there and it says the certificate has expired well what the what you're what you're seeing there when you go to the digital signature section is the result of when verify trust which is a, a user mode function whereas uh, the kernel mode code signing policy is completely different because that's in 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 the kernel um, so what you see returned by the when verify trust function will it, generally speaking not always be what the uh, kernel mode code signing policy checks for. And what I mean by that is if the wind verify trust returns, this is expired or this is revoked. Um, there it, some reasons that a kernel code, uh, that you might be able to still load that driver is because um, at the time of signing, it was still valid. Uh, so it, it, even without a timestamp, it, the kernel, is, it just assumes that so, since this was at some point signed by a valid certificate, even if the certificate expired, um, it still uh, it still should be loaded. That seems like a problem. <laughs> yeah, it seems like an. Yeah, yeah. I think it's mostly going to be for compatibility reasons. Uh, that's what I'd I guess yeah. assume. But it's 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 speculation. Given that you know I, I don't work for Microsoft, so I don't know right. the reasoning behind it. I'm, I'm sure there's a whole lot of history there. Um, so we have a uh, another question. Um, uh, Trinsky is asking if you have any interest in creating a uh, roadmap of resources, courses, or tutorials on your blog. A person can get to your level of reserve, reverse engineering competency. Um, yeah. So <laughs> for for that question, um, it, it's it's mostly you know most of my I guess knowledge comes from just experience, and and the best recommendation I can really give is to um, I just try things out. You know, do CTFs if if you want to learn reverse engineering. You know, do these CTFs. Um, and really, you know, one of the ways that I go about, you know, uh, looking for even projects or stuff to do is I'm, I, I always stay curious. And what I mean by that is if I see some weird functionality by a program I'm using, on, like in real life on my Lizard machine, I will probably quickly try to check underneath of what's happening here. You know, why is it doing this one weird thing? And oftentimes I've found that that can actually lead to other issues, like actual security issues. Uh, so if you're looking for what you know what what projects to do or what what to reverse, um, it's really just going to be the software you use in your everyday life. Um, and in, I, I don't have any plans to do like a course or something on um, just you know tutorials on how to reverse engineer, for example. Uh, but it, it's going to be really going out and finding uh, finding your own projects at that uh, that you find interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so that you'll continue pursuing it. That's, that's, I guess, the trick I did. The reason that I was able to learn so fast was because I always did stuff I was always interested in. And that was, you know, in specifically game hacking. I love games, and um, I'm bad at games. So <laughs> I had a, a you know, self-interest to continue reverse engineering these games and um, figuring out how they work and maybe how the anti-cheat works. And then you'll you'll end up learning a lot from just you know trying out things, uh, trying trying to reverse new programs you might have not had uh, looked at before, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Well, a quick step back then. So you said uh, you watch as a program does something unusual. It's not exactly the words you used, but um, what types of unusual things are you expecting? What what types of things would uh, sure 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 make the radar go off? So just to give you an example of a, like a vulnerability I found uh, a few years ago was um, I, in, in the software called Dell Support Assist and how that worked was uh, when I went to um, update my drivers because I installed a new SSD, I needed drivers for that one machine. Uh, the website claimed uh, to be able to update my drivers, but from the website itself. And I was like, how does a website <laughs> update my drivers? Well, it turns out that Dell pre-installs this software that 
it basically allows its own website to communicate with it and install stuff like updates. Well, that's kind of weird, you know, because you're allowing a website to have that sort of access. And then I, I reverse engineered it further, and I found that the restrictions there weren't quite uh, as strong. Uh, and I found a way to bypass the restrictions uh, the application had. Um, but so the weird part there was, well, it's a website claiming to, you know, update my drivers. That's that's not normal. The websites, it normally can't just do it automatically update my drivers itself. Uh, you know, it might be something I have to install and do it myself. But uh, so in that case, that was something weird. It's just basically finding these, you know, why does this thing happen? Why did they design it this way? Uh, and it's looking for those logical flaws uh, in, in their, like, design or just their code itself yeah so th this is this is one that i've actually uh, hit myself um uh, rptk 2015 uh, asking uh, another question uh, like keep him coming this dude's it's pretty uh or chick I, I don't know uh could you explain on how secure boot blocks some of the driver signing methods i've definitely noticed that some drivers work with uvfi and some don't and it's usually a driver signature problem yeah so the main issue you're gonna have with secure boot is um if if you're like going after um, using a leak certificate, or if you're buying your own certificate, uh, the thing to consider is if the certificate was issued after July 29th, 2015, that's the cutoff date, then you're going to need a EV certificate, so extended validation certificate on newer versions of Windows 10. So what that means is you're going to have to, um, basically the, the certificate vendors that give you these certif the code signing certificates have to, you know, do extra validation. And typically the certificate is given to you on like a USB drive instead of just sending you the private key file. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, you know, it, for versions of Windows 10 that have secure boot enabled, you're basically preventing drivers that aren't signed with an EV certificate. Uh, to be loaded, just because that that's the, that's the policy it follows in in, the, in those newer versions. Um, and so, but if your leak certificate was released before, uh, issued before July 29th, 2015, then it will still work on these uh, on these newer builds with this secure boot protection, I guess you call. It. Mm -hmm. There is uh, sort of an extension of that. Um, uh, when I when I encountered this issue, there was a uh, a registry flag that you could set that was. Uh, sort of bypassed it. Uh, it was unattended upgrade. It was from Windows 7 to Windows 10 upgrades. Yeah. Did you try playing around with that to see if it might like... Uh, no, I, no, I, mostly because the lease certificates, like, you can just the ones publicly available are issued before that cutoff date. So, oh, okay. I mean, it's like, there's so like almost issued. all of them are issued. I mean, at least right now, you know, the lease certificates I used was when, when I found it was issued before that date. So um, I haven't actually found the lease certificate that was issued after it. Yet. So, it's, so it's easy enough to find it that you haven't had to hunt down that uh, possible other way to get it done. Right, right, right. And so there's a quite diff quite a number of ways you can approach the problem of you know getting your driver lo loaded. And at at that point, well, if you if you don't even need to look into you know other ways, there it's it's not it's a non-issue, I guess you could call it. Uh, but it's something to keep in mind, you know, going forward once those leak certificates start to run out. Um, you're probably going to run into that issue of that date restriction. Um, and at that point, I'd probably recommend you, uh, the second method of uh, loading a driver and if using a, another legitimate driver that has been signed with like an EV certificate. Uh, but again, the problem with that, uh, in my talk I mentioned it, is that you cannot run into a lot of stability issues when abusing another driver and trying to load your own, uh, just because there's oftentimes going to be stability concerns like race conditions. That makes sense. Uh, so uh, Trunsky is asking, uh, did you test your rootkit against any of the top EDRs? Uh, no, I didn't. But the one of the I took EDRs into consideration when designing the application, and for example, how I hook um, communication between the AFT driver and user mode applications. Um, I always went for methods that would try to uh, make it as expensive as possible to detect. Um, because I, I feel like that's the best approach is uh, not security through obscurity. Um, it's going to be how can I make the uh, antivirus have to go through an, a very expensive and time-consuming process to detect me because oftentimes they'll reconsider for those reasons. Or another cons uh, another perspective might be how can I um, cause compatibility issues? Like if there's an application that already does these suspicious operations, maybe I can uh, go in, like impersonate that application and the antivirus would have to accept it because the legitimate application also does yeah. suspicious operations. Trigger bad false positives that they can't work around themselves. 
Right, right, right. Or yeah. it's very difficult to detect around that. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, f- I feel like a lot of security is just making the other side do more work to get to the same goal. So oh. RPTKS asks another question here. Um, there was some uh, some method you're able to let's see. There were not HVCI compatible. Can you please explain a little bit about uh, HVCI mitigations? Uh, yeah. So the um, HVCI. Uh, let me look what it stands for. It's like yeah, virtualization based uh, protection of code integrity. So essentially, what it does is it's a mitigation. Uh, if you have virtualization enabled, you should be able to enable it. Um, that basically makes it so the once the driver is loaded into memory, uh, especially, especially its executable sections, it can never again have those executable sections set to writable. Um, the memory fly, uh, memory protections will it will never be able to be um, writable for that uh, memory page because it's an executable section. So essentially, it prevents um, code hooking, for example, or basically modifying the actual bytes of the driver's uh, executable code. That makes sense. Uh, can, so uh, I, I, I apparently missed this. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your Peacemaker project and how it compares to Spectre? Uh, sure. So Peacemaker was a, um, basically, it was a, a proof of concept EDR that I wrote a few months ago, which was basically the opposite of what I'm doing now. Instead of writing a rootkit, I wrote a driver to detect malware. And the way, I mean, the biggest difference between the two is the fact that one of them is a blue teaming uh, defense application while the other one is a rootkit. Um, but uh, it, when it, how does it compare? Uh, well, Peacemaker is going to be, um, I, I believe it's a little bit less efficient in general. Um, and I followed a stricter code design policy for myself um in in this latest one so i mean it those are i guess how it compares but they're two different projects for two mm-hmm. different reasons that's fair um so speaking about other projects and other places you might want to push this research um, you already mentioned a little bit about a gap of um the upgrade process uh for if you end up running out of certificates that were signed before the uh, cutoff date, what other interesting things are out there for somebody who wants to do research in the same field that you're in? What would you recommend for somebody who is looking for a neat project to uh, um, jump in and start working? Um, so for, I guess, neat projects of, of where to start, it, it, it would first of all be... Um, if you're interested in learning more about the Windows kernel or the internals of uh, the Windows operating system, it, the best recommendation I have is, besides experience, um, is going to be some of the books out there include the Windows internals. Uh, seventh edition is the latest one um, that really goes into depth about the internals of the Windows operating system. Uh, but it, it's really going to be finding a way to make security interesting for you or make learning uh, interesting to you. And that's the best way I can recommend, I guess, of how to, uh, what's the best way to go about learning these difficult topics is um, is to gamify it and is to incentivize the research itself. Um, but yeah, in, in general, it's it's going to be most, most of your experience and knowledge is going to come from experience and just playing with things, trying new things. And uh, mm. for for projects you could do, it's, it's really, it varies. You can try looking at uh, re- like reversing drivers for vulnerabilities in their IOCTAL interface. That's what, that's what I've I've started with at least. Um, and you can try to find a way to abuse those drivers, uh, like the abuse legitimate drivers portion. Um, if you're looking for some drivers to I guess that might be vulnerable, uh, a lot of OEM drivers have security issues in them. Um, I'm I, I'm just always shocked. Just look. I'm, it's I've become desensitized to it. Just uh, almost every OEM driver has something questionable in it, um, and I, I guess so. That's that's the place to start if you're looking for vulnerable drivers. It almost sounds like as you're approaching these projects, looking <laughs> the new thing pops out at you. Maybe not from getting a depth into. Hey, I'm gonna find all of the drivers out there, but what are you, you're looking for other things, you're learning everything you can, and then 
the the context for your next project kind of filters out from that, or do you find that you have to you have to go searching for what you're going to attack next? So in general, not even just like Windows kernel stuff. Um, I generally don't search for projects to do. I, again, it's just finding stuff that might be interesting. Like, um, you know, if, if a program is doing some, something suspicious, there you go. That's a project right there. Find out why it's doing that thing. <laughs> or is there anything similar that's doing that could be called into question? Um, but for Windows kernel, you know, uh, one thing I do uh, is I am I try to get part of the uh, virus scanning platforms out there. Like one I, I am part of is like hybrid analysis. And what I'll do is I'll occasionally search for drivers on there and download them and just take a quick peek under the hood and you can see, see what's going on there. Um, and so that's a good place to, I guess, find these driver files if you're trying to search for them. Um, but generally speaking... Sorry, go oh, ahead. Uh, I was going to say, are, like, are those already infected drivers, or are these just like a reference, or are these just like uh, tons of driver like repository kind of thing? It's just a repository. Like these aren't okay. necessarily bad drivers or vulnerable drivers. These are just um, potent, like uh, might be a legitimate driver as well. So it's just a driver repository. Have you looked at any uh, other driver infections just to see how they are doing those hooks to? to like get basically similar ideas and work back from like the attack side rather than being like, oh, this is weird. Instead, like, oh, this is an active attack. How are they doing this? Could this apply to other situations? So basically, do you look at malware or do you just look for new things in weird drivers? I I look for new things in weird drivers. Um, I don't specifically just look at like drivers I know that are malicious. Uh, the, the what I do is you know I'll I'll reverse engineer like I said OEM drivers. Um, and that, that's a starting point. Those are legitimate. And so, uh, and I'll just look into the, what I can find. Is there, it, first of all, it's like auditing attack surface is finding out what you, can you actually talk to. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's finding out now, you know, what you can talk to, what are the access controls in place that limit how much you can talk to the application. And, you know, it's going from there. It's, it's that type of investigation of, you know, what can you access and how can you mani manipulate what you can access? Cool. So uh, Truinsky asked a question that fits into kind of the direction we, I was pointing there of how do you balance your personal life and doing research? So you're clearly deeply involved in this. Um, at what point do you, at what point is this all you do and, and how do you uh, fit in the rest of the stuff you want to do with your life? Uh, yeah. So, well, specifically how I manage my time is going to, it, the big thing is, you know, over the summer, I, I didn't do most of my, most of my research was before while I was in school. So before, you know, any internship or summer work. Uh, so it's going to be in school. I've just, I've uh, too much free time. Um, and so I just spend that time researching or, uh, you know, I, I spend some of that time trying to research things and it's, it's different. You know, if you have a full-time job, I, I don't know if I have a recommendation for you because a uh, fact is I, I know how like 40 hours a week is rough. Um, you, you know, you'll, you'll probably be tired uh, when you get home. So, a, you know, doing research then it can be difficult sometimes. And so I don't know if I have any recommendations specific to that, but in general, I try to use this uh, free time I have as much as possible, like uh, valuably, I guess. And, um, and, and since I have so much free time in school, you know, I, I, I dedicate a portion of that, uh, to doing my own research. That's awesome. So not that we want to point towards anything specific, but uh, you did mention that there were some CTFs out there that uh, are good training resources. Uh, maybe this is a good time for you to say, do you have a favorite CTF for teaching this type of material? Other than, you know, you were talking about the Windows, Windows internal stuff that you can read the 30-pound uh, uh, book. So it's actually really unfortunate. I find that a lot of CTFs don't really focus on Windows related challenges. Um, it's really rare you'll see like a, an actual challenge that's dedicated uh, about Windows internals. It's usually, you know, like if, you're, it's a, if it's like a binary exploitation thing, uh, generally speaking, I see it being like a Linux application, right? Um, maybe running even on like the ARM architecture. Uh, but I, I just rarely see, I, I don't have any good CTFs to recommend for Windows related stuff um, just because oftentimes you probably won't see windows related stuff uh you one one of them i can i know i can men, uh, mention that it's pretty good it's i guess you call my favorite ctf overall is the flare flare on reversing ctf uh they have some really interesting challenges there you know it's not just going to be windows stuff it's going to be you know reversing a bunch of different architectures and applications figuring out what they do um it's 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 one of the favorite ones i participate in so 
also, I mean, I guess that also kind of exposes like that. That CTF sounds awesome. It seems like uh, any for anyone that's watching, uh, there's a, a gap in the community. Uh, Windows CTFs. There you go. Next DefCon talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what's next for you? If you could pick which direction you would point for your uh, for your next research topic. Um, that's difficult to say. I honestly don't have a next direction. I don't have the next project. I, I'm uh, again. I kind of just go with the flow. I see. It, it really is literally just um, a, looking at the everyday software I use, and then if I know, I, I just tend to notice stuff uh, like this is weird, and that's how I how I go about doing it. For this specific, for my talk, how I came up with it, I guess you could say is um, is uh, our schools or, or our schools security club. A red team needed a uh, new. We wanted new malware to use against our best blue team competitors. We, so we yeah. run competitions where we do um, like we simulate a corporate environment, and you have a red team that tries to maintain persistence, and a blue team that tries to kick you out. Blue teams also have like uptime and these challenges that they have to keep services up uh, while the red team tries to mess with them. And so f there was just a need there for me to develop some tooling against like, his, uh, our top blue teamers. Um, and so that's why I decided to look into this, you know, maybe like uh, two birds with one stone type thing. You know, I thought it'd be interesting. Uh, no one's, uh, so there's educational resources about rootkits out there, like books, I know for sure. Um, but I, I haven't really seen open source tooling ar around, root, uh, you know, when kernel level Windows rootkits out there. It's rare to see it. Um, so I thought it would actually be a pretty interesting project. Yeah. Looks like it turned out that way. Did yeah. you did you end up crushing the blue team with this? Uh, yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, I, they, they did not. Ex <laughs> I, I remember having conversations about you know like um, I, when I when I suggested that I was abusing legitimate communication, explaining to these blue teamers how I was doing things, um, they were really confused about you know like how, how would you abuse a legitimate port on my machine because um, they were of course <laughs> looking for malware and I was using so they have to have certain services uptime right. Uh, yep. So they have to have these services always up. So I was just using that fact to get into their machine because they could like take down that service. Uh, so even if they knew and they didn't, um, that I was abusing these legitimate services for communication, um, you know, they they would firewall everything except for those services, and I'd still be able to get access because you know going uh, communicating through their services. So yeah, um, it, it was it was a really fun time. <laughs> um. Uh, one person is asking for a clarification on uh, the CTF, like where they can find it. The Flare On, uh, they found Flare hyphen On uh, dot com. Yeah, uh, it is. It is the Flare On, uh, Flare okay. hyphen dot com is is okay. the one I mentioned. Cool. We are and uh, right. another question from uh, RPTK twenty fifteen. Uh, in the resources uh, you proposed, uh, React OS. Could you explain a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, sure. So React OS is a uh, essentially um, a bunch of and engineers reverse engineered to windows kernel and wrote it one-to-one -one. I, I i wouldn't say obviously it's not one-to-one 100 -one, but it's actually like insanely accurate uh of the actual windows kernel so it's it's kind of like an open source windows kernel uh you'll find that a lot of the functions in the actual kernel has been re-implemented in there a lot of, it, it follows the same structure it's 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 just quite literally an open an open source clone of windows um, and it's a, an amazing resource because uh, sometimes you'll find, you know, undocumented functions. You don't know what it does. And luckily, you can go to the React OS uh, project and just take a look at the source of that because people have spent hours reversing that one function for you. Now, some of this is going to be outdated because the React OS kernel replicates the XP kernel, um, but still the co core functionality is going to be pretty similar. Excellent. So awesome. we are right at the end of our scheduled time. Is there anything else you'd like to impart upon us before we uh, we um, call it for the day? Yeah, I mean, not really. I, I, I appreciate everyone <laughs> for coming out to my talk. Um, you, you know, keep in mind uh, that uh, rootkits are... I, I haven't, I, I'd like more red teamers to start using Windows kernel level rootkits uh, and going that route because I think there's a, some... Uh, interesting, uh, you know, more advanced actors use it, and I feel like more red teamers need to start uh, like simulating those advanced actors that have been using these rootkit techniques for years. I just feel like you know we have so much, we have such a good community for user mode malware, uh, but we rarely see much for a kernel mode, 
if, if that makes sense. So I guess that's the parting message is uh, please start looking into it because um, the real ad- adversaries out there are already have this ready to go. That makes sense. Well, awesome. we'll get you to post all of your uh, contact information into track one and uh, let people uh, find you wherever you tell them that they can find you. And I really appreciate that you uh, gave us some time today to both give that presentation and then spend this time in the Q and a. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see more from you soon. Yep. Have a good one. Thank you, Bill. Thanks guys.